You're in for a real treat, everybody. Jasmine Thomas is here to talk about her comeback and everything she's done and everything she's going to do. Locked on Women's Basketball starts now. Ogumba Wallet for the win. You are Locked on Women's Basketball. Your daily podcast on women's basketball. Well, hi, everyone, and welcome to Lockdown Women's Basketball. I'm your host, Howard Meddahl, thanking you for making us your first listen every day. Again, just a huge July for us, over 100,000 listeners just in that month alone. Third month in a row we did it. You guys are showing up for us, and we really appreciate it. And it's not just me, of course. It's the incredible group over at The Next, thenextsoups.com, where we have over 100 women's basketball stories Every month, we have a reporter in all 12 markets. So go to thenexthoops.com, subscribe for $9 a month, $72 a year, support the work that we are doing. And the work that I've done for the longest time, and I, I, I don't really consider it work, but it's the opportunity to cover Jasmine Thomas's career. Uh, Jasmine joins us today to talk about her comeback, where things are with the Sparks and where she's going. Jazz. It is great to be with you, and I guess the place I really want to start is just, can you take me through what it felt like that first moment you walked back out onto the court? What was that moment like for you? What do you remember? Um, I mean, it was a scary moment. I, I feel like that's what I remember, is just being really nervous and excited, but also, like, it was the first time really being, you know, kind of full go. The way that my recovery kind of went, I didn't have that, like, I wasn't in training camp, so I didn't have that time to kind of be in full contact doing, you know, all the contact drills before the season started. So once I got back on the court playing games, I was really using games to get my rhythm back, which was um, just a, you know, a nerve wrecking kind of experience. But um, honestly, I just had to stay patient, you know, and, and still have grace with myself during this this process. I think what is it? I'm like, 14 months out of surgery right now. So, you know, still definitely healed, definitely recovered, but still this is a different part of that, that uh, comeback journey now. So you talked about that comeback journey and obviously it's, it's grace required for you in terms of getting back out there, but even just your role is obviously so different and just, you know, to take a moment, I, I, I want our listeners to make sure I assume they know, but for those who don't, you are an iron woman throughout your career and you were just, you know, playing year after year here overseas, you name it to be able to come back here, but go slow. What are your coping mechanisms? How do you figure out how to navigate that? Just that psychological space. Um, I mean, it's definitely hard. It, it, it's a challenge daily, but um, I think it's a little bit leaning on just who I am as a person and how, who I am as a teammate, you know, for me, just, how I prepare, making sure I'm lifting extra, doing extra workouts, doing extra cardio, um, talking, communicating, still leading my team, um, still being vocal. I think uh, that's how I just kind of stay ready each each day. Obviously, leading your team was a critical reason why uh, Kurt and uh, KB brought you over to play in LA. Take me through just sort of those conversations and how those have dovetailed with the way in which you're able to lead on a day-to-day -day basis for this team that, and we'll get into it, obviously, has been through a lot this year. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, just I've been around the league for a long time. Um, I've, you know, had success in this league for a long time. So kind of taking that experience, taking that veteran leadership role of being able to kind of know what the highs and lows are like, know what it, uh, you know, the preparation and, and Kurt's system and how we prepare on offense and defense, just kind of being familiar with all of that puts me in a good position to be able to, you know, talk to my teammates through it all. I don't know that people fully appreciate, I, I think we've talked about this, I think I've even written about it, just the two-way nature of your successes. But to me, somebody who's been on five all first or second team defensive teams in this league mm -hmm. and is the 15th ranked assist leader mm -hmm. in the history of the WNBA. Like th those numbers speak for themselves. Mm -hmm. When you are emphasizing these things to your teammates, though, I just wonder, do you find yourself 
being uh, more uh, vocal on the defensive side of things, the offensive side of things? Like, where does the rubber hit the road with that leadership for you? Um, I honestly feel like it's on both sides. Mm -hmm. um, definitely, you know, defense has always been my comfort. It's been where I've like made a name for myself. It's where I, you know, where I take my pride in is just really being tough nose and um, locked into game plans, knowing player personnel. So I definitely talk a lot on the defensive end, but also in the offense, just because this is a system that I've been in. So kind of seeing how those, how it's been successful in the past and how it has to, you know, there's a whole different personnel here. So it changes a little bit to, to fit this system, but um, I think I've been able to be vocal on that side too and kind of ease some of those frustrations or maybe help when, you know, actions aren't feeling as good as we want them to, how we can, you know, run different sets or get dirt certain people in, in different situations. I feel like whether it's in practice or shoot arounds in film or in games that I'm able to kind of help give some information to my teammates. And then the physical side of it, are you feeling like you're where you were? Are you feeling like you're where you want to be? You know, kind of take me through that, where yeah. you are on that arc. Yeah, I'm definitely not where I want to be. I feel like um, I am in a good place as far as when I look at myself when I first came back to now, um, mm -hmm. I'm way less hesitant, I'm way more um, physical. I'm you know not scared to get in the paint, not scared to get in the mix, but uh, there's still another, another level that I know that I'm going to reach. And that comes with just getting more strength, getting more, you know, this is the first time in 32, 33 years that I went a year without playing basketball. Right. So for me, it's more so it's the rust as well as the conditioning, just getting back to feeling like myself 100%. But from a health standpoint, I'm in a, I'm in a good place. I'm glad to hear yeah. it. It's not, but it's not like a straight line is what you're saying. No, it's not. It's um, it's yeah, just because for me, it's like a strength thing. Um, I've always been a strong player. Like you said, I've been an iron woman. Um, but in your recovery process, it's where you have that atrophy. It's it's overloaded. You know, it's like strength on like max, get as strong as you possibly can. So for me, um, that's just a big thing that I still keep focusing on. Even throughout this season, I've still really, really, really been focusing on getting my legs as strong as I can. So um, the stronger I get, the better I feel. And so that's like the part of the journey that I'm still on. And so what do you do when you have one of those ebb days, one of those down days? How do you kind of get yourself feeling back to where you want to be the next day? Um, just a great medical system team that we have here between our physical therapists um, that are awesome. We have a whole bunch of resources. We have Courtney, um, who's a phenomenal trainer, and she gives us a great staff of people. I work a lot with Emily, our strength and conditioning coach. So just the full body of hands, um, you know, Charvet, Regina, we have masseuse is just all hands on deck for the recovery process. Cause that's the thing I can play a game. You know, my minutes have been all over the place this season, whether from four to eight to 20 plus, you know, so I can play the game. It's just that recovery, getting ready for the next game. And in the season where you're playing 40 games and, you know, playing every other day or traveling in between, that's when it gets tough is that recovery to get back to, to feeling good for the next game. And I know just off the court, you know, to be in a new city, to be in a new place, we'll talk in segment two about the Sparks themselves, but, you know, how has L.A. been for you? I just mean, you know, the city itself mm -hmm. is, you know, getting getting uh, acclimated there. Um, it's honestly been really cool. My childhood best friend moved to L.A., I want to say four or five years ago. She's a nurse. So for us to be reconnected there has been really, really cool because for the last few years, I've been traveling all over the place and we haven't gotten to see each other a lot. So that has definitely helped. And then I met an awesome friend group through her. So I got a, you know, a good little support group outside of the team. So it's been pretty cool. Well, I love to hear it. And eager to talk about because the L.A., story and what you guys are building is really interesting to me. We're going to get into that in segment two. First, though, want to let everybody at home know about FanDuel. And FanDuel, of course, includes football season. NFL season is about to kick off. And FanDuel gives you a chance to win all season long. 
Right now, when you bet on a Super Bowl winner, you can get bonus bets every time that team wins in the regular season. So you just pick any team to win the Super Bowl. I, I'm just outside of Philadelphia. So if you pick anyone other than the Eagles, there, you know, people will be very upset around where I live. But whoever you pick, you get bonus bets for every victory. You can use your bonus bets on point spread, player props, over under, you name it. You go to fanduel.com slash locked on. That's fanduel.com slash L-O-C-K-E-D-O-N and start earning bonus bets with America's number one sports book. That's FanDuel.com slash locked on. So when we think about LA and what you guys are building and putting together there. There's a, kind of a couple of ways I want to uh, approach this. And one of them is this is a team built around a lot of shooters. And I'm just wondering from a pure like pleasure perspective to be a point guard, to know that you can kick the ball out to, you know, to, to Carly Samuelson, you know, to Lexi when she's able to be out there to be able to uh, have that kind of spacing. How does it change what, like you said, is the Kurt system that you were operating in in Connecticut as well? Um, I mean, I feel like Kurt's system is designed for spacing, you know. So when you have shooters on the floor, it makes it easier to get that spacing. And I think, um, you know, you have someone like JC who's really good at getting in the paint and putting pressure on the defense. So when the floor is spread, it, it, it allows her to be able to do that and spray the ball or score it herself. Mm-hmm. And then you know, we have our, our bigs. You can't, you know, we have the amazing NECA who is dominant down there in the post. So being able to give her room to work and then with the size and, and length and screen and separating ability of Dierka and Azare, I feel like you put all the pieces together and you, you know, you get the spacing you want, you get the, the actions are more successful when you can, you know, have that spacing. It just feels like Azure is even scratching the surface. I mean, seeing her back healthy and seeing her able to play, I, what do you feel like her ceiling is? I mean, I I don't know if she has one. You know, I feel like she can really be very, very, very dynamic. We've seen it um, this season. And, you know, when she's really aggressive, like offensively and defensively, she's really special. So, um, you know, she she has great hands. She can catch any pass you give to her, um, able to space the floor, shoot the three, play off the dribble. Um, Plus, you know, she has great length. So down there being able to finish and, you know, get rebounds. I think that's something also that I really love that she's been getting offensive rebounds when some of those shots aren't going in. She's cleaning them up and finishing them. And and she's just been great. Yeah, no, it it is going to be fascinating. The fact that she's in a position to be able to get the minutes and the opportunities to be able to score here is going to be, as you know, it's so much about opportunity in this league. It is so much about that. The, the shooting, and, and just before we get off of spacing to talk about this, this is something that you developed over the course of your career as well. And just for those who may not know at home, you were a solid three-point shooter coming out of school at Duke. Um, is Duke in the ACC right now? Do we know? Yeah, still in the ACC, I think, I hope, for now. <laughs> but as we're recording, they're in the ACC. They're probably going to be in a made-up new conference by the time this posts in an hour. <laughs> but... At any rate, you came out, you could shoot, you took it to another level. And from 2017 through 2021, you were shooting north of 36% from three. What do you account for as allowing you to make that leap forward, number one? And number two, you know, is that part of what you're able to see from your teammates? Is, you know, is that coachable, I guess, is what I'm trying to say. Um, I think a bit of it is coachable. I think in that time, uh, you know, it was getting the reps, it was doing the work, it was, you know, working on my shot, shooting a lot and having confidence from my teammates and my coaches to shoot the three. Mm -hmm. And it was the style of play. The ball was moving. um, It wasn't sticking. Everyone was making the open pass and hitting the open player. So when you're hitting, when you're getting shots in rhythm like that, they obviously feel good. And I think that's kind of the same thing that happens here when we're making the right passes and giving confidence to our teammates by making those extra passes. And, you know, we call them good to great, good to greats and finding our, our open teammates for the extras, the shots go in. It reminds me a lot of what Jordan Canada is doing this year. When you see sort of that parallel with the jump you took at a similar point in your career it is. So I, I, it feels like that's what you're seeing. You're seeing the fact that she's taking threes, 
in good to greats rather than maybe forcing him a little uh, sooner in a possession uh, as a difference maker this year. I'm just wondering how much you are working with her. I know that's obviously got to be a significant part of the, you know, the, the daily day-to-day here with the Sparks. Is that what you're seeing out of her? Because her three-point shooting has gone up in a, in a similar way. Um, yeah, for sure. I didn't know JC going into this season, um, mm-hmm. but from being around her now, I know that a lot of what we're seeing is the work that she put in herself too. Sure. Um, you know, I'm sure from the feedback from last season or from the past, she may have had things that she needed to work on or things that she was doing well. And I think you're seeing her take those things into account and be better at them this season on top of what's being coached here. You know, I don't want to discredit the work that she's done for herself as well, but I think she's definitely doing a great job of taking that work and implementing it into this system that is here. Yeah, I mean, it, it's clear to see. It's fascinating. And, you know, a shameless plug, we'll have Jordan on the ca- on the uh, program on Thursday. Looking forward mm-hmm. to that. Oh, yeah, cool. <laughs> so, you know, very, very sparks heavy week for us. We're mm-hmm. looking forward to all of it. In terms of the sparks themselves, and so you guys sit 10 and 18 right now, but it reminds me a lot of spot that you guys were in in Connecticut in 2016, where uh, the season, I think you guys started two and 12, it was something like that. You ended up 14 and 20. There was a lot of progress made. And I talked to Kurt about this a couple of weeks ago. He talked about the fact that that progress made over the latter half of the season carried into an extended period of success that you, you were able to have. And so a couple of questions about that. One is how important when you look back was that end to your 2016 season in everything that followed? Um, I think it's just the momentum, you know, like when you see the pieces finally come together, when you see things start to click and start to feel good and the chemistry start to get rolling, you kind of take that momentum into the future, you know? Mm -hmm. So I think uh, it's, it's sticking with it, trusting the process. It's really being not results driven, but focusing on what we're actually trying to do here. And, you know, I think once you get the full buy-in and you see it come together, that was what was important about that season is, yeah, it might not have been a, a playoff season, whereas here we still have a chance to be able to do that, you know, but it's it's all the things that you can carry over into it, you know, kind of like how, you know, you have those games where it's like, OK, you know, we might not win this one because maybe it got a little too far away from you, but you want to end the game strong because it, that momentum takes you in the next one. I think that's how a season can be, too. Did you know it at the time, back in 2016? Did you feel like, well, we really are on the cusp of it, or is it only in retrospect? I think so. I think when I, you know, it's kind of a while ago now, but when I really think back to that time, I feel like we also had a time where we were kind of like this, a lot of close games. You know, it's not like we were getting blown out and we were having, you know, do just these awful, awful games. It's like you could see flashes of it. You could, it just was not consistent, you know, and I think that's what you could, what you could start to feel is like, okay, we're, we're learning how to close games. You know, that's what, that's what we have to learn how to do is, you know, one, be consistent and play in a full 40 minutes. And then when we get ourselves in position to win, actually winning them. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, which, and obviously the results are always the last thing that comes with a winning team. You know, mm-hmm. everything has to lock into place. It's like a safe and you put all the numbers in and only then can the combination work and it opens. So that yeah. makes a ton of sense to me. You, of course, played 34 games that year, uh, Mm -hmm. as you so often did. The following year you made, and point of personal privilege, this is ridiculous, your only all-star game appearance. Mm -hmm. It would be more than one, but that's a whole other story for another time. It was a period of significant success for you guys for a half a decade. And, Mm -hmm. and, And we'll get a little bit into this in segment three, but just, you know, as you conceive of the window in L.A., the fact that you know, you, you have Neck, who's obviously, again, playing at her prime level. She's playing, to my mind, she's playing at her MVP level from 2016. So we're seeing that all over again. Does it feel as if you guys are set up for this period of extended success? Um, I think so. I think, you know, the... I don't know, the focus for us was kind of keeping a core at that time in Connecticut. So I feel like maybe that's Kind of a, the same thing here. You keep, you get some players together that you feel are clicking, that you have all the right pieces. You got the leadership, you got the the shooting, the the scoring, the you know the the dominant post, the point guard. You know, like you got all the pieces together, and you just kind of keep adding to it, kind of tweaking it, figuring out what makes it work, and really get to its its maximum potential, and then you kind of run with it. 
it's going to be fascinating. So segment three, in just a moment, we're going to talk about the future of Jasmine Thomas. So I don't like when you say things like it was a long time ago, because it feels like just yesterday to me that we were talking about that. I remember uh, chatting at Mohegan uh, and it was the, the team was about to head on this really, in many ways, unprecedented run of success that you guys have had. Um, now, all of that said, yes, time has passed. As you are trying to figure out what is ahead for you, I just wonder the way the way you think about it, and, and, and in a couple of ways. Number one, you know, what is overseas for you? Is overseas something you want to continue to do to incorporate? Um, has your thinking changed about that in the last couple of years? Um, it actually has just because I have wanted to pursue some, you know, off the court opportunities mm -hmm. in the off season to try, you know, figure out what, what I would do after basketball. Now having an injury that obviously I wasn't expecting, no one is ever expecting. Um, I think kind of not changed things a little bit for me, but I want to go out on my own terms. You know, I don't want to go out on an injury. I don't want to go out not playing or feeling like myself. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, now where I am in this process, I know for sure that I'm going to get back to feeling like myself. So I would rather kind of focus on getting there and then plan this out as long as I can. And then using those off seasons to do those, you know, front office things, do some internships, do some, you know, I did the broadcast thing last year. So yeah. for me, I think it's more beneficial for me to do some of those things off the court when I can. And, and people, if you're listening, you call jazz. Like I, I, every time I needed to learn more, even if I was writing about a teammate, even if I was writing about a lead trend, I come to you. So like, mm -hmm. Learn from her wisdom. That's just a <laughs> fearless plot. But um, beyond that, even the the game itself, being away from it, and like you said, it was the first time you were away from it for an extended period of time. Do you find more joy in the day to day? Do you find yourself able to to reach that in a different way? I just wonder what that's like for you. Um, I mean, I do. I think I'm just, you know, grateful to have the game. Like, uh, you know, I. Yeah. Until you you don't realize it, like you hear all the stories from all the athletes that have, you know, gone through injuries and, you know, you you empathize, but you don't really get it unless you have gone through it. You know, when you have something that you're that passionate about that consumes you, that's so much a big part of your identity taken away from you, you know, you you get a whole new appreciation for it. So I think I definitely feel that. Um, and I'm happy that I was able to kind of get that have that feeling, you know, and feel that joy from this experience and understand how this is just an amazing opportunity to be able to do what I love for a living, you know? So I definitely feel that. I would say the frustrating part comes from just that, you know, that impatient, that that wanting to, to just get it all back right away. You know, that is what's the tough part. Well, anyone who doubts you is making a huge mistake. It's a matter of time for it. Jasmine Thomas, I am delighted to have had you on the program. Always good to chat to our listeners. Uh, I appreciate you every single day. We'll be back with you tomorrow. The great Lexi Hull will be joining us talking about her season with the Indiana Fever. Until then, I am Howard Meddahl wishing all of you a wonderful Tuesday. Ogumba Wale for the win. You are locked on women's basketball. Your daily podcast on women's basketball.